This is a dynamic climbing rope. One can take hundreds of these massive falls and it will still provide a soft landing for the climber. Now let's ignore the blue protective sheath and pull out the core. So these white strands is the core of the rope, which is responsible for majority of rope's strength. If I would untwist the core strand, eventually I would get to this thing, which is called a multi-filament. And if I would dig deeper and try to separate the smallest part of the rope, I would get to a single filament, which I can barely see. So this is a single filament. So this filament is about 10 times thinner than the human hair and there is about 50 to 80 thousand of them in a single rope and all of them run across entire length of the rope. Now during the fall these filaments stretch but also they slide past each other which creates friction and this friction helps to dampen the impact. However, if we would make a rope wet, water on the surface of the filaments would act as a lubricant. This would allow the filaments to slide easier past each other, which would reduce the dampening effect. Also, you can probably imagine that as I want to stretch the rope out, it needs to shrink in diameter. However, if the rope is full of water, in order to shrink in diameter, first it needs to spit the water out. However, if the impact is hard enough, the water cannot escape fast enough. It's like when you belly flop on the water and the water doesn't have enough time to flow around your body. And things get even more interesting from here. If we would look deeper, deep deep inside the filament, we would find this. But don't worry, the only thing you need to know that this is a monomer which joins together to form a polymer chain. And this chain can be very long, very, very long, which is really great for making filament fiber. And this is where things get interesting. Notice that some parts of this fiber are arranged neatly in order. These parts are called crystalline and they have polymer chains packed so close together that they form an attraction for each other. And this happens because hydrogen from one chain really likes the oxygen from the other chain. So all of this makes these parts really strong, which is great for the strength of the rope. However, it also makes these parts really stiff, which is not so great when you want your dynamic rope to stretch. And that's what these other parts that look like spaghettis are for. They are called amorphous, and they have much bigger gaps between the chains, which allows them to stretch. So when the force is applied on the fiber, these spaghetti parts stretch and the crystalline parts provide the strength. You can probably imagine that a very stiff rope wouldn't be great for climbing, but neither the rope which would stretch too much, because when I fall I want to land not on the ground. So by controlling the ratio between spaghettis and crystalline parts, rope manufacturers can create this. Great strength, but at the same time perfect force absorption. Which is quite impressive. Now remember I said that hydrogen really likes the oxygen? Guess what else has a lot of hydrogen and oxygen? That's right, water. Good news is that water cannot really penetrate into the crystalline parts of the fiber, because the chains there are very packed close together already. However, spaghetti parts have gaps and that allows water to come in and bond to the chains. And this bonding increases the distance between the chains and it also weakens the intermolecular attraction. So now, if the force is applied when the fiber is wet, Spaghettis might stretch more than what they are capable to recover from. And that might damage the entire structure of the fiber. But all of that is in theory. So let's see if that theory applies to real world climbing situations. I'm singing in the rain. I'm singing in the rain. And if you're wondering who goes climbing in the rain, well, this was my birthday. 
and we came up with a brilliant idea to climb 34 routes in a day and half of the day was raining. So yeah, let's say I have some wet experiences, but my anecdotal experiences are not science and to do proper science I needed to go to the place where the ropes are properly tested. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and before we begin, a strange fact. I checked a lot of user manuals of dynamic climbing ropes from various brands and about half of them have various warnings about wet ropes. However, the other half doesn't mention anything. Hmm? Hmm. Okay, so here is the question. Will dry rope cause harder catch on realistic fall scenario? Well, we would say over time, yes. In the beginning, probably not. So you mean on a first fall, maybe not? Yes. And on the repeated falls, probably yes. Exactly. Let's see. Oh boy, first statement made. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> now, since we wanted to mimic real world scenarios, and hard falls rarely exceed 4 kN, we needed to modify the drop tower to produce the forces between 3 and 4 kN. So we overshoot. Yes, we did. Messages. By a lot. <laughs> okay, and go. Which took a bit of adjustment on this old drop tower. Mammoth actually has a way more advanced drop tower, which I already had the pleasure to use when we were testing the cut resistance of the ropes, which was super interesting. Yeah, that's easier with the other one because it works electronically. You can put in the number where you want to go and then it aligns it by itself. But we are not allowed to use it. Not for the water, no. It doesn't like water? No. So this one doesn't like the water. Uh, this one also doesn't like water. No, as soon as these get wet, rust will appear off the wall and then friction has a big influence on the... Yeah, but this one, we don't use this for any development or production control. Yeah, so we just really That's why we are allowed to make it wet. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard you going like <laughs> the frustration <laughs> and not only we needed to make sure that our samples are between three and four kilonewtons but also that each of them is as similar as possible how is it going? We have a method of how we can always make the knots equal. Later we will have fun <laughs> preparing ah. samples. It's a group activity. It's a team building for <laughs> Yes. How many samples do we need? Depends on you. How many samples do we need? Depends on how many people we have making them. <laughs> <laughs> Too many. How is it going? Okay. So what's Lots going on? are equal. Length is equal. Everything is equal. Having samples as similar as possible was actually really important because as Adriana said, textiles is a very tricky and moody raw material to work with. Moody? It's very moody, yes. <laughs> so although we cannot control the mood of the rope, but in order to make the nice statistics that you're gonna see later in this video, we needed to try our best. Ah. So it's one too long. So basically, we are massaging back and forth to get. Uh, yeah, it's what we in German call Sisyphus Arbeit. No, we got it. You think so? <laughs> if not, <laughs> it's time for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Either we succeed <laughs> or we eat. <laughs> Everybody, please. Yeah, take go. <gasps> Three points. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, when I was editing this, I thought, wow, if you ever wonder how geeks are celebrating life, this is a prime example. Anyway, the next question was, is our test setup repeatable? 
meaning will we get the second fall to be close to the first one? If we don't get that, then we five hours more. <laughs> don't make a night session. <laughs> Work till five and then you go bouldering. We have time limit. Because we need to go bouldering. Because we need to go bouldering. <laughs> Whoa! Very nice. That's very good. Very Swiss accurate. <laughs> <laughs> so, our setup was working really well, and now we needed to collect a lot of data. This might say. If we wait three minutes and we do five falls, that's 15 minutes just waiting times three, times six, 15. I... The eyes are getting bigger and bigger. Yes. <laughs> and here are the results. If we average all the samples, we get the baseline of how the force is increasing with every fall, which shows that rope doesn't have enough time to fully recover. So let's see what happens when the ropes are wet. Look how much air is coming out. All the air is escaping from the rope during the fall. The water will be trying to escape trying to blast out of your rope. We wanted to do three different tests where the ropes were soaked for one, five and 15 minutes. And what was interesting that fully submerging the rope for just one minute was enough to almost completely saturate the rope, meaning that soaking for longer did not add any extra weight. And after we dropped all the wet samples and enjoyed the, the splashing of the water everywhere. Wow. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Shit, there is a lot coming out. Here are the results. Since the difference in water absorption was minimal, the forces were actually very similar. And if we take the average of all the wet samples, we can see that the first fall was only slightly harder. However, the difference increases with the subsequent falls. You know, it's combining everything. It's a family. So statistically significant. Good day. Very good Today day. we made a page. <laughs> <laughs> Science. A little future me interruption since I got more information. The peak forces that we measured obviously do contribute to how hard the catch will be for the climber. However, it's not the only factor. The peak force to the climber usually happens around this moment. But even on the hardest falls, this moment is not hard enough for the human body to be a problem. What is the problem, however, is how hard the climber will hit the wall. As I mentioned earlier, as the rope is stretching, the filaments are rubbing against each other, which dampens the energy. And if the rope would be able to absorb all the energy during the fall, it would stretch and then stop. However, that's not what happens on hard falls. Normally, the rope will act like a spring will stretch and then bounce back. And that bounce back usually creates more energy going towards the wall. And if the rope is wet, the filaments are sliding easier past each other, which reduces the dampening effect. So the bounce back into the wall should be harder. So I was really curious to test this. However, this requires more advanced testing facilities. But luckily, after I left, Mahmoud did this test in another facility and sent me the results. Here is the force graph where the initial peak was set to be around 3.6 kilonewtons. And after that, we can see how the rope bounces a couple of times. Now, in the case of the wet rope, the peak is only slightly higher However, the spring effect is much higher. And this is the same graph after five consecutive falls. The initial peak was 23% harder. However, the bounce was much harder. So the spring effect was much bigger. All right, so far we confirmed that wet ropes might cause harder falls. But also, according to the theory, wet drops might lead to some permanent damage to the rope. Let's see. So we left the last rope hanging overnight. So technically now it's dry and, um, <laughs> no and rested. So we dropped this rope once again and the fall was harder compared to the baseline, 
which definitely hints that there was some permanent damage done to the rope. Alright, so far so good. And there was two more experiments I wanted to make. First of all, we did all our tests on classic ropes, so I was curious how dry treated ropes would perform on the same tests. And in case you don't know, dry treated ropes are soaked in certain chemicals that make them more water resistant. Our dry ropes, we add the chemical first to the core, so to the strands, they get a drop application. Then we braid the rope together and then we submerge it in a chemical bath. Then we take it out and we dry it and then you have a dry rope. So basically core is separately submerged into chemical and then entire rope. No, the core get a drop application meaning. Just a little drop every, every couple seconds is enough to make it uh, water resistant. Interesting. And then the entire rope goes into mm -hmm. the thing. Yeah, when it's finished. So let's see how good that treatment is in practice. Yeah. Day two. So at first we did a lot of drops without water and that allowed us to compare treated ropes with classic ones. And it was good to see that treatment has no negative effect when the ropes are dry. So let's see if it has a positive effect when the ropes are wet. Number two. Number two. You want to get a shot of how treated ropes don't bubble? Or do they bubble? Wait, maybe I don't want to. Look, it doesn't bubble as much as the other one. What if you squeeze it a bit? How about no squeezing? <laughs> And yes, dry treated ropes absorbed significantly less water. Ah, you know what can be the problem? The ends. I see bubbles coming from the ends a little bit. Although we seal the ends, but most of the bubbles are coming from the tip of the rope. Maybe I'm gonna keep that tip just a little bit out. Yeah, I mean, you can always have like little holes where it could get in. With these kind of things, if it's not seared well in the end, you have like a capillary effect of that the water travels yeah, up yeah. along the mm -hmm. fiber. Okay, let's see. I'm super curious. One, two, three. Wow, there was no splash of water. <laughs> and here is the treated rope that we soaked for 15 minutes. As you can see, there is still barely any water coming out of it. And if we would compare this to the classic ropes, the difference is huge. We're still here collecting the data. <laughs> Never ending story. <laughs> How are we feeling, Tim? Yay! Energy level up here. Stoked for climbing. And when it comes to the treated ropes, soaking them up to five minutes showed no increase in forces. However, soaking for 15 minutes already was worse, but not as bad compared to the classic ropes. So dry treated ropes unsurprisingly were performing better in wet conditions. However, I know that many of you, myself included, had a question. How long does dry treatment stay effective? Does it wear off? So this is a used rope that I used for about a year, mm -hmm. actively almost climbing every second or every third day. So we could get a sample of this. Yeah, let's do it. This orange rope that I brought is actually perfect for our comparisons because it's exactly the same rope as the one we already tested. The only difference is the color. At first, we did the test without water so that we could compare how much stiffer old rope gets compared to the new one. And to my surprise, the difference was very minimal. One note here is that we selected the test sample from the middle of the rope. That part of the rope usually is the least damaged. But that's good to know that if your ends of the rope are damaged and you chop them off, the rest of the rope should perform really well. Oh, it's bubbling much more than uh, new ropes. Yeah. And yes, old rope absorbed more water. However, it still performed better compared to the classic rope being new. Treated rope soaked for five minutes. Let's see how it, how well it served. <laughs> <laughs> We 
actually washed the rope, but you can still see that the water which comes out of it is still grayish a little bit coming out. It's dirt. So you want to blame my washing machine? <laughs> and this is what happened with the wet old rope. The first fall was actually identical, which is very nice. And then the subsequent falls again had an increase in forces. And if we would compare all wet ropes, this is what we get. And the only thing missing here that we had no time to do would be to test old classic ropes. So yes, treated ropes do lose their water repellent magic over time. However, they still perform better compared to the classic ropes. However, there is still one very interesting thing to know. Let's look into water absorption graph again. Notice that classic ropes are almost fully saturated after 5 minutes. However, treated ropes, even after 15 minutes, still have a trend up. So then the question is, what's the full saturation point of treated ropes? So I asked Adriana to do these tests, and here are the results. Turns out that all the ropes were trending to the same, around 40% level. So that means even if your rope is dry treated and you put it under water and you leave it there for long enough, I don't know why would you do that, but if you would do that, eventually all of these tens of thousands of tiny filaments in the rope would act as capillaries and the water would find its way in and it would probably perform similar to the rope being not treated. Now, before some of you will become hydrophobic, let me add a couple of things. Yes, wet ropes are significantly heavier, which sucks when you're climbing, and they might wear down quicker, both from falls and from abrasion, which um, sucks to your wallet. Also, there is a theory that they are thicker, we swell from water. Let's see. I soaked this rope for a few hours. This is supposed to be 9.8 rope and I'm measuring 11.3. Let's see the wet spot. Okay. So I don't see any difference, at least on this rope, which is worn out and it's already thicker than its uh, nominal value. Yeah, so I didn't want to leave my fellow climbers hanging like that. So the next day, I took a bunch of different used ropes, soaked them, and measured the thickness. And what I found out is that indeed some of the ropes did got thicker, like the green decathlon rope, for example. However, other ropes did not change in diameter. Next, I tested how smooth the ropes run through belaying devices. And here my findings were mixed again. Some of the ropes got sticky. They became harder to pull through belaying device and more likely to lock the belaying device. However, other ropes got the opposite result. They became more slippery as if water would lubricate the belaying device. So yes, belaying does change with water. However, it's unclear how the change will affect your rope. And about those other things, well, honestly, it's unlikely that you will climb in such a wet conditions long enough to even have those problems. So if your rope got a bit wet, well, try it. But if I would be going to cold, wet, ice climbing, places where people die, <laughs> um, yeah, maybe having a treated rope reduces the chance of dying. This is so harshly put, I mean, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> just like uh, being in a snowy or icy environment, it's recommended to have the dry treatment because it's just an extra safety buffer. Yeah, there is one route in uh, Spain which crosses a waterfall in Multipitch. Yeah, I mean, also if you climb in very humid conditions, the it's Thailand. the same. I mean, if you go there, yeah. it's really humid and dry rope makes sense. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's a little details. <laughs> Shall we go to Thailand to do some science? Research trip. <laughs> yeah, it is. All right, 
If you found this video interesting, I made a playlist for you, where I was nerding with Mammoth engineers on different topics, very interesting topics. So thank you Mammoth for letting me to periodically come over and play with your toys. And thank you Adriana for all the rope chemistry explanations. And thank you for watching. See you in the next one.